I don't know how to describe it other than like like a demon type of sound. But it's silhouetted, hulking, every bit of five and a half feet wide, 13 to 14 foot tall, pitch black. The one thing that ran through my mind when I had this encounter was I don't have a big enough gun. Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevnik. Welcome to Creek Devil. Hello everyone, welcome to another edition of Creek Devil. As I mentioned on the last episode, um, I was in New Mexico on vacation for a couple of weeks recently, and it just happened to be that I was in the same town where T.W. lives. You know, everybody's heard T.W. on the show before. Uh, We're going to cover some things that we have covered previously with him because I took pictures of the locations where some of the things have happened in the past there. So I thought it would be interesting to, you know, kind of recap some of those and then we'll post the photographs so you can actually see where these events took place. And there was also a recent one while I was down there, uh, an event happened an encounter happened just three weeks prior to my going there. So um, that's what we're going to do with this episode. So, T.W., how you doing, man? I'm doing good. How about y'all? We're we're doing fine. I'm kind of missing being on vacation, but, you know, it's kind of the way things go. You know, that's the bad thing about vacation. Get you finally get into the groove of it, you start to enjoy it, and you got to go back to work. I know. I, I could definitely be retired. It wouldn't bother me a bit. <laughs> so let's, uh, Tom, I'm going to have you go ahead and kick things off, I think, uh, since he, he, Tom bought a, uh, he's got a Blue Yeti microphone like I have now. So um, let's go ahead and begin, uh, I guess, with the most recent thing that happened there, T.W., yeah, uh, well, I mean, uh, not far from where where my house is, uh, there's an area that, uh, you know, believe it or not, of, uh, of uh, somewhat significant historical uh, prominence. It was an area where Billy the Kid and his gang used to hide out. It's also the, uh, the stretch of land that the Butterfield stagecoach line used to run across as it was coming from Sacramento, California into uh, New Mexico on into to Oklahoma. Um, there were some kids out there. It's all on BLM land. Uh, there were some kids out there. Oh, probably a, if I remember right, it wasn't, it wasn't, but maybe about a month or so, ago that that they were out there and they were out there drinking having a good time when i first heard it i was like yeah they're out there drinking all right they're out there probably smoking pot but uh they were out there uh, with their friends and uh all of a sudden they started getting pelted with rocks and uh you know they didn't think much of it. You know, they just thought, you know, one of the kids was playing a joke until the thing stood up. And it was in the, uh, it was in the, the, well, you know, well, you've seen it. It's, it's all mesquite and creosote bush. Uh, this thing probably had been watching them for a while and uh, stood up. Kids noticed it. They're like, "Audio, see you later. Bye. We don't need to be in here anymore." And uh, a friend of mine, that's deputy, that took the report because the kids were pretty well rattled. Uh, kind of told me about it. I, you know, I kind of asked him. I said, "You gonna, you gonna file the report?" And he goes, "Oh hell no! I don't want to get fired." <laughs> <laughs> I kind of laughed at him. I'm like, well, let me go out there and see what's really going on. That could be some clown out there just just jacking with him. Well, when I went out there, and he told me exactly where it was, that whole area is a, uh, for lack of a better better way to put it, it's a it's a washout draw is what it is. Uh, 
so I get in there and I start looking around and I start seeing signs. Stacked rocks, uh, broken limbs, uh, definite uh, uh, trail paths going in and out of there that weren't there before and hadn't been there in a while. Um, so, you know, it got me to thinking, okay, what could be here? Um, but when I was at that one spot where they were parked, because they weren't even really in the draw, they were just next to it. Um, got me to thinking that's probably might be a, tra- a transient band. Uh, and if it is, then that's probably what they're using as a nursery. Uh, there's not, there's dirt there, but it's so hard packed. There's no way that uh, that they'd be able to sink a, a foot in it uh, unless it got wet. It'd have to be wet for a while. But uh, it, it's really kind of... Uh, Riverstone, washout rock area. So you're not going to find too many tracks, but the stacked stones, you know, they were all over the place. So, uh, yeah, it was kind of an interesting uh, uh, daylight encounter. It happened uh, right about dusk. And it was, uh, you know, I, I have every confidence that these kids saw what they thought they saw. Yeah, I, I took some pictures of the rock stacks. Those are very interesting. Tom, Brian, you guys have questions about this particular incident? Yeah, I, I do. Um, first question or just comment is, you know, I was telling Will, I was, maybe maybe the Bigfoot just wanted some beer and they weren't sharing. Um, <laughs> that that aside, did did the kids, uh, did they give the deputy a description, you know, like, maybe how big it was or what color it was or, you know, any, uh, any kind of details? What uh, what Mikey had told me was is that they said it was real big, hairy. Uh, it was dark color. Uh, they couldn't distinguish, because uh, there were three boys. Uh, they couldn't distinguish whether it was black, dark brown, or a, a really, really dark red. So it was, I mean, that's why I kind of said, okay, uh, maybe they were in there smoking pot. Uh, said it was extremely tall, very wide-shouldered. Uh, Mikey said the, the two boys, which are football players, uh, stood together, and he said it was wider than us put together. And he said, these are pretty good sized kids. These are kids that are, you know, six, three, six, four and weigh about, you know, 285 a piece. So they're pretty broad shouldered cats. Uh, and I'm like, okay, well, maybe, maybe they saw something. Maybe they didn't, uh, said it was about, uh, about 30 yards behind them when it stood up. Um, uh, and said, just, just glared at them. And that's when they said, you know, we're out of here, bye. And they took off. So to to say definitively, because I didn't even talk to the boys. He wouldn't give me the names. But uh, to say definitively uh, any kind of, you know, facial features, that uh, that wasn't in the report. Mikey didn't, uh, you know, convey that to me. Just said he was really extremely tall and very, very broad-shouldered, very, uh, very wide. Yeah, but everything they've said so far is consistent with one of these creatures. I think it would have been golden to have a camera out there, not only to see the creature, but I'd love to see the expression on these guys when they have that aha moment and realize what's out there with them. Well, and that's just it, you know. It's uh, yeah, I got I got a little upset with Mike because he wouldn't he would give me the kids' names because I wanted to, uh, you know, I wanted to talk to him and, and kind of press him a little bit uh, 
to, you know, see if I can get them to, you know, give me some more information, make them think. Um, he wouldn't do it. He said, no, he said, you know better than that. He said, that, that'd be my ass. I'd end up getting fired over that. And I'm like, all right. So, you know, I, I went off of what, what was given to me after going out there and investigating it, you know, just kind of kicking around looking. I, I, you know, I have no doubt that they, they had an encounter. Uh, how many was in that area is up to speculation. Uh no, definitely one, but I, you know, like I said, that, that whole area is a uh, washout draw. So that would, that would serve them well as a, uh, a hiding place, uh, definitely a nursery. Uh, and it's funny that you brought up, you know, they wanted a beer, uh, uh, several years ago, um, uh, uh, I was talking with another researcher that uh, was in Oklahoma and some kids were out drinking and one walked up, opened up the cooler and took a beer out and walked off. <laughs> so, well, and I, you know, was, I, I was all but calling him a liar. And he said, no, he said uh, I wasn't the only person that they told that to. They thought it was another, you know, another one of the kids from the group until it got, you know, more into the ambient light close to the cooler, and then they couldn't believe what was reaching in their cooler and taking out a beer. So, You know, that's a that's a beer commercial if I ever ever heard one. I'm telling you. <laughs> I'm telling you. That's, that's like the Kokanee commercial, you know, with Rene DeHinnon. Have you guys seen that? I have. Uh, you know, where he's, he's talking, and then, you know, the trailer behind him is being ransacked by the Bigfoot. <laughs> Oh Lord! <laughs> let me let hey, me ask. You. T, oh, oh, sorry, Brian. I'll, real quick, sorry about that. T.W. Is your historic precedence in that area where the kids were uh, in the draw of these things? You know, besides Billy the Kid, uh, any Bigfoot uh, reported? No, activity? that's. I mean, that's really kind of the first uh, sighting that I know of in that area. Uh, we've had uh, in the past. We've had sightings in the area if you were to draw you know a, a 50 mile circumference you know 50 mile circle around las cruces we've had sightings within that area but not at that one particular location at least none that i'm aware of hey let me ask uh, was this their first time seeing one of these creatures or had they had any previous yeah. experiences or encounters no uh-uh uh-uh uh, not that I'm aware of, uh, you know, uh, like I said, Mikey, uh, you know, he kind of pressed him a little bit and, and he said, the one kid kept saying, he said, you know, been watching, you know, finding Bigfoot and thought it was all a bunch of shit. And then, you know, now I know it's real. It's actually out there. So that kind of tells me a lot. Um, you run into the people that that are naysayers, and, and you know they don't budge until they actually have something stand within their you know their right. their viewing field, and they can't explain it. It totally disrupts what they believe is real and what isn't. Right now, when they when they left. Did they say whether the Bigfoot went back into hiding or did it sort of walk after them or? They didn't. Um, at least not as far as what Mikey had told me. Um, they, they, he said they just got out of the area. As a matter of fact, and it's, it, yo, know, it's not a short trip getting out of that area. It's, we're probably back off the main road by at least two and a half, three miles. And that's a, you know, like I said, it's when I first heard it, I'm like, okay, they're back there partying, probably smoking dope. It's a great area for them to do all that stuff and not be bothered with law enforcement, not be bothered with neighbors or somebody ratting them out to their parents. 
uh, it's not unusual that on weekends, uh, that's where they'd have a, a beer party, you know, where all the high school kids, seniors get together and, and, you know, they'll have a bonfire and, and drink a bunch of beer. And, uh, of course we'd all be stacked out on main road waiting for them to come out and, you know, and start nailing them for DWIs. But, uh, <laughs> And that's, I mean, that's, uh, it, it's, it's an odd area because as the crow flies, there's water resources all over the place. There's an old way station uh, uh, where the Butterfield stage line would have, uh, they'd have horses, uh, you know, replacement horses to, to replace the horses that, that, just came from Deming and that's how they would replace their, their horses. Uh, every, I think it's every 10 or 12 miles is what the, the standard was, uh, because they're pulling a heavy wagon. Uh, they're pulling it in a semi-solid, uh, riverbed that, uh, is, probably been dry for 300 years only gets wet when it rains uh and it doesn't last very long you know it no sooner gets wet and it dries right up so uh you know will's even seen that yeah i said well there's a water tank there used to be in a windmill now it's all solar powered there's water resource there there's uh you go behind back at the end of that that whole uh, washout area that there's a uh, uh, 15, 20 foot cliff there. Uh, you go over that cliff and up back up onto the plateau and you go another couple of miles and you're at a, a dam area that uh, the BLM put in a, a dam for water catchment for livestock. And uh, so they got, they got a water resource right there. They don't, uh, as the crow flies, they can go another three and a half, four miles, and they're at the the Rio Grande River. So it's uh, it, to me, that's an ideal stopping area. If if it's a migratory band, that would be an ideal area for food and and water uh, uh, for them to. And there's livestock in there all the time. So that's another food resource. Uh, they'd probably take a young steer or young calf and uh, have little to no notice from anybody. Yeah. Hey, now, Deb, is there any reports of missing livestock? No, not that I'm aware of. Uh, what agency but, would that normally get reported to? That would be reported to uh, the brand inspectors, New Mexico Brand Stock Growers Association. Uh, and the, the local brand inspector, I hadn't had a chance to sit down with him and ask him if there's been any missing livestock. But, you know, even though uh, uh, Las Cruces is somewhat industrialized, it's still an agricultural-based community. A lot of farms in this area. A uh, lot of stock growers, uh, and and I've noticed this over the time I've lived in this area. Their animal husbandry practices is not what I grew up with. They may go out and check their livestock once a month. If I had livestock in that area, I'd be out there every day, if not every other day. Because, uh, you know, it doesn't take long for a scavenger to come in and destroy uh, a carcass uh, on a kill from, say, like a mountain lion. What's left over, they'd have picked clean in just a matter of days. And you would have, you'd think somebody come in there and stole a calf. Or if the cow had a calf, and you didn't know about it, and say a mountain lion come in and killed it, 
well, hell, that's, I mean, that's lost money. But you'd sure. never know. Is it still a common practice to, how do, how do ranchers, um, how do they brand, how do they identify their stock? They still that, brand, they, still... they earmark, uh, ear tags. Uh, a lot of them in this area still do all three. You know, they'll, they... uh, they'll not use, and, and use, uh, use uh, ear tags. And by, by New Mexico law, they have to brand. Okay, very interesting. Do they, um, so I, I'm assuming maybe there's some common grazing areas so that when you go in or, and do a roundup or, or whatever to get your cattle, that's how you can identify, you know, your. Yeah, yeah, you got, uh, you got 90 days from uh, date of birth to brand a calf. Uh, in the state of New Mexico, uh, if you don't brand your livestock, it belongs to the state. And you know what? I'm just obstinate enough. I'm not going to give any more money to the state than I have to. <laughs> what um, What can you tell us about New Mexico in general? I know that you've had plenty of experiences. Uh, one of my very... I guess it's one of my favorite stories, and I've talked about it before, but there was a, uh, I think a Mescalero Indian who was oh, yeah, sleeping the on old, the barn. Uh, boy that uh, uh, zapped one with a cattle prod. <laughs> yeah, yes, that story can... was told to me. Yeah, that story was told to me by, uh, by a couple of Mescaleros. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, he goes up into the loft after a you know, day of work and helping brand cattle. He's, he's sleeping in the hayloft. And, uh, you know, it, when you work all day, it, especially on a lot of cattle ranches, you, you'll get fed. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, you have a couple of beers. And, uh, you know, and everybody either goes camps out in their vehicle or, you know, sleeps in the barn. And, and uh Till next morning, if you still have work, or next morning you get up and and you leave, go have breakfast, go to your next uh, uh, day ranching job. Well, he he was up in the loft and thought one of the other cowboys was jacking with him and felt that felt something moving around on him, and he had that cattle prod laying next to him, and he was sleeping up in that hayloft and went and grabbed that cattle prod and jabbed it, jabbed the damn Sasquatch right in the damn shoulder, knocked him off the damn uh, ladder, or at least uh, thought he was probably up on the first run. There wasn't enough room for for a Sasquatch to get up in the hayloft with him because there wasn't enough headroom for him to stand up straight to begin with. Uh, but knocked him off, and, and uh, boy, the rodeo was on then. You know, they had a a six steer that they were trying to, you know, bring back to health. And hell, he killed that. He was running around the damn barn trying to get to him, tear down the barn and raising all kinds of hell. And he finally waited till that damn thing was on the other side of the building. And he jumps out the, the hayloft now and, and runs to his truck and holds out. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the, the my, my favorite stories, you know, the rodeo was on then, you know, that was it. There were there were two other incidents we want to cover first, you know, before we go too much uh, off off uh, target here um, that I took pictures of, so the listeners can see. One of them involved a fifteen year old kid, and the other one was you and the deputy. Um, I don't know which one of those you want to start. Yeah. Maybe the kid first, because that kind of that's kind of in order of how things went. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in order to tell about the the boy. Uh, there'd been some instances, uh, prior to that, uh, animal control officer found a bunch of dead dogs, uh, in a semi, uh, industrial, but an abandoned site thought maybe it was, a you know, a dog fighting ring was there fighting dogs and that wasn't it. It was a bunch of pit bulls. Uh, and they were pretty well tore apart. 
Um, and then there was another instance where uh, uh old couple in that area was asleep. A rock got thrown through their window. Uh, he goes, looks around, goes out on the front porch. And as he steps out, there's one standing not far from the front porch and takes a swipe at him, just barely misses him. Um, then uh, I get a phone call from a deputy, uh, El Paso County. Um, and that area is, it's patrolled by both Donia and El Paso County. Uh, Texas, New Mexico has a reciprocity agreement about concurrent jurisdiction. And uh, it's not unusual for the phone company to accidentally send you to the wrong 911 dispatcher. Uh, because that area is, it's got several cell phone towers and the switchboard is commingled with, you know, greater El Paso's switchboard. So you may end up in, you know, El Paso's 911 switchboard and you still in the New Mexico, uh, 911 district, but there's concurrent jurisdiction. So there's patrolling by both you know, Texas and New Mexico deputies. Anyways, the boy was at a friend's house. Uh, it was it was late at night, uh, not terribly late, probably 8.30, 9 o'clock, decides to go home. Uh, he uh, gets on his bicycle. The boy's in band. Uh starts pedaling, gets to an area that a stretch of road, there's no, uh, because there's a bend in the road, there's not a lot of uh, street lamps in that area. But, but because there's a bend in the road, there's a, you know, a street lamp uh, in that bend, so that way nobody gets into a car wreck. They can see other vehicles coming on or see livestock out on the road. Well, Felt like there was something behind him, he said. He stops his bike and turns around. There's one on all fours looking right at him. And it was every bit of on all fours, six foot tall. Uh, kid freaks out, starts taking off. Well, the thing apparently grabs a hold of the back of his bike, uh, slings him off the bike. The kid didn't even miss a beat. I guess he did a uh tactical combat role and you know got up he was running and ran all the way back to his house uh when they called 911 deputy showed up took his statement took him to the area well that's where they found the bicycle in the tree and it was it was uh it was a little the frame was a little bent but uh but it was up in the tree about 15 feet and uh, just right off the road. So, uh, you know, that's when the deputy called me up. And he knew that I'd, uh, you know, had been, you know, lodging questions around about, you know, what what's going on around here. Uh, and at the time, I worked for the city of Vinton. And... Uh, and that's before they disbanded our uh, department. Uh, of course, there's there's speculation that I probably had a little bit to do with the disbanding, but uh, not on just that level. There was a couple other things that had transpired that uh, the city didn't want getting out and being public. Uh, one of them was the uh, city manager was commingling federal grants with general funds. And when you get federal grants for whether it's for fire or law enforcement or city works, they all have to be in separate accounts because you have to account for how much money is taken out during that time period. So uh, needless to say, uh, Vinton doesn't have a police department anymore. But uh, this deputy, you know, kind of, 
brought it to my attention. He knew I was asking questions about the the y'all you know, the dead dog incident and you know all the carcasses at that one area and uh said well you know hey why don't we uh see what we can see because this kid's really rattled i said okay i said well yeah i'll tell you what uh meet me at my department on saturday night when i'm on duty and we'll drive around and this is uh, late October, early November time frame. And uh, we're in the area, and we're not far from where Kid had his encounter. And uh, of course, at that point, I'm you know I'm you know driving less than five miles an hour. It's like creeping along, and we got our takedown lights on, and we're scanning all these pastures and the. Uh, you know, pecan orchard area. And, and uh, we get to this one area that's a pecan orchard. And, and you know, takedown lights only go so far. And uh, it's not like they'll shoot a beam 500 feet. They don't. They're just simple, you know, you know, condescent bulbs that you buy at uh, local auto zone. And uh, we see eye shine in this, this one field. Uh, and it's a, you know, it's a fairly new pecan orchard. It's got some older trees in it, but not, not a whole lot. It's got more newer growth in there than it does anything else. Uh, and you know, as we're counting all the different sets of eyes that we, we see in this, this field, uh, something had come up right from behind us and it roared. Well, Deputy Gonzalez brings a leak. I step on it. And I damn near wreck trying to get us out of the area. Uh, and I'm texting Will the whole time saying, holy shit, he's right behind us. Uh, and as I get him up to, uh, you know, the Denny's, which isn't that far as a crow flies, it's probably less than five miles. Uh, you know, you get over by Highway 10 and that that's where the Denny's is at and get him out of the out of the patrol vehicle and and when I say Gonzalez sprung a leak, I ain't kidding. He pissed himself. And, you know, the whole way getting to the to the Denny's, he's like, you know, it, it roared at us. It roared at us like a lion. It roared at us. And I'm like, yeah, I know. So uh tried to get him up there and get him calmed down while his supervisor shows up. Next thing I know, he gets in the vehicle with the supervisor and I get to do another bout of a uh, piss and match with city council and a few other uh, discreet individuals that had been apparently monitoring our activity. Um, one of which I got to be pretty good friends with, uh, but that's only because I pulled him over when he was running code. Uh, he was running code with, uh, with siren, but no light. And, uh, you know, I pull him over and I'm like, Hey, you know, better to run code without, without lights. What the hell's going on? You know, you're, you're breaking prima facie speed. Uh, you know, do me a favor. <clears throat> Include me. Let me help you. I can probably help you out more than you'll ever want to admit. And there was two of them. One was a real ass. The other one actually ended up, like I said, became, uh, started to become a pretty good friend. Um, and he didn't view me as a threat. Uh, but the other one looked like a big giant biker. Um, and I didn't have a whole lot of use for him. I, I thought he was a horse's ass, to be honest with you. Hey, uh, real quickly, uh, let me go back to the kid with the bike. I mean, unfortunately, we don't know who that that kid is it would be great if we if we could find him and have him on our, on the show to talk about his experience but one of the interesting things that i learned about this and from from will is that when they found the bike in the tree it wasn't actually the exact location as when the creature took the bike right it, it, it had actually carried it down i think like 100 yards 
uh, from where the spot was. And then it, ways. it carried a little ways. Uh, probably, I don't know if it was 100 yards. Uh, it was a distance, but it wasn't uh, It wasn't a tremendous amount of distance. Uh, uh, you know, 50, 75 yards, my estimation, you know, but that's uh, – I never really taped it out and I never really got to talk to the kid. I just talked to the deputy. Yeah, that is, that is interesting. It makes you wonder though. Um, I mean, did the kid, I mean, I mean, he, he ran right away, right? He got the heck out of there <laughs> as soon as yeah, that. he didn't, he didn't waste any time. He no sooner got off that bike, you know, got chucked off the bikes. What happened when it grabbed the back of his bike, it basically threw him forward and he went over the, the handlebars and, uh, you know, me and the deputy was kind of chuckling about that after when he was telling me, he said, he said, you know, I can almost see that kid not even really touching the ground other than when his feet met the, the pavement and he was hauling ass. <laughs> <laughs> you know, now, like, yeah. The bike itself, was it, uh, I assume it was really damaged, right? The, the, I'm sure it had been bent and, so forth, the, right? The, the frame had been bent. Um, not because uh, I actually did get to see the bike. Uh, it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't a terrible bend, but it was. I mean, it it pretty much rendered that bike uh, where the forks come off the back of the bike for the back tire in uh, that uh, upright for the where the peg where the seat sits into that that area was bent uh it would uh it would cause problems for him to to ride that bike ever again and i don't know that there's any way to straighten it out to be honest with you you know you think about the strength involved i mean that's you know those bikes are what rolled steel or rolled aluminum it's oh it's shoot, just, now you can get you get bikes that are carbon fiber yeah uh super lightweight uh i don't think that kid's got that kind of money you know of course that, that could be wrong but you know carbon fiber bikes gonna run you you know five six thousand dollars yeah they're spending uh, crazy yeah but uh it probably had a, a you know a you know probably a walmart special bike that most people buy for their kids around here well yeah and you know, I I always thought I even told Will this. I said, you know, I wish that bike was still around because that'd be a great uh, museum piece for uh, if somebody wanted to have a you know like a Bigfoot museum. And yeah, um, yeah, uh, Lauren would probably pay big bucks <laughs> to have that to put in his museum. <laughs> so that happened. What you know, just out of curiosity, what year was that? When that happened, that was in 2015, 2015. So that kid would be about what, 21, 22 now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, kid, if you're out there and you're listening, <laughs> we'd love to hear from you. Uh, you know, it's uh, just a little side note because there was blood on that bike. Um, uh, Gonzo actually did a, uh, a DNA swab on that sent it in. Well, on DNA analysis, it takes anywhere from six months to a year for the for the report to come back. It's not like you see on uh, CSI or NCIS television shows where it comes back within you know a day or two. We don't ever get reports that quick. Um, and all DNA analysis. Uh, get sent to Austin. Swab the bike, sent it in. Apparently somebody at the lab screwed up and ran uh, a complete DNA analysis on that on that swab. And I know the report come back, it cost uh, El Paso Sheriff's Office 20 grand for that one analysis. And it came what's back. The difference? In, what, what's the difference between those two? Why is it in, why uh, is one 20 grand? A, a basic, uh, uh, 
you know, basic genotype analysis is about 500 bucks, and it just shows, uh, you know, male, female, uh, blood type, uh, human or not human. A complete analysis will run the entire genome, which when they put it in the in the uh, sequencer, takes them a shit long time. Uh, yeah, I say a shit long time. It takes them 72 hours to run a complete genome. And when they ran that analysis, it had primate uh, DNA attributes, had human DNA attributes, and had other attributes in there that they couldn't, uh, they'd never seen before. Hey, let me ask, uh, how was the creature's blood on the bike in the first place? Was it in the process of grabbing the bike? It, it cut itself, or did the kid, like, I, scratch it? Probably what had happened is that when it grabbed the bike, it probably cut itself, uh, because it was in the area where the, where it was bent up, uh, on the, uh, the upright post where the seat goes in. Um, and that's, uh, that's where they actually, uh, pulled the, uh, the swab from. So I'm thinking maybe there was a reflector back there and as it grabbed it, it cut itself on that, on that metal bracket that holds the reflector. Do they keep the DNA? Does anybody keep that report or does it just get chucked after a while? No, it. Something like that is public record. Will you be able to get your hands on it? No, because I couldn't get my hands on it. Trust me, I tried. I was I was calling in favors galore. Um, and they're not going to... Something like that. Uh, if there's a lab screw up, it doesn't apply to the, to the initial crime. They still have to, they have to archive it, but where they archive it, it, uh, you know, I'm not real sure if it's at the, the sheriff's office or if they just send it to Austin. And, uh, I know when I worked for Solana PD, they, we sent all our archive DNA analysis to, uh, Austin and they would archive it and they'd load it into CODIS. Do you think it was uh, maybe intentionally concealed because of the results? Well, I know Gonzo got into a shitload of trouble because they charged the sheriff $20,000 for the report. So, you know, your guess is as good as mine, but I'd probably say. (laughs) I think that there's a. Now there's there's been reports down past El Paso down down by Socorro and Horizon City. Uh, they called it the Fagan's Dog Man. Uh, several years ago, they had several encounters down that way, uh, which is still El Paso County. Um, and uh it caused a big stir you know in the in the late 90s um and i just discovered this here just a couple of years ago uh doing research in the area on is you know there been any other encounters well apparently there has been um and when i say down by fagans that's fagans is a uh it's an old movie ranch uh, they used it for the border with Jack Nicholson, Lone Wolf McQuaid filmed out there. Uh, they filmed Uncommon Valor out there. Uh, it's a big movie set, but they also have like a steakhouse and uh, and they, you know, Socorro's over on the other side of the highway. But they had, they had had encounters in the, in those areas. Now going ahead forward to the uh, the incident with you and your partner that, that ended up in Denny's. Was this your partner's first time experiencing 
uh, that, or had he? I know that you had seen the creature before, but had he? Yeah, no, <laughs> no, that was uh, like I said when he sprung a leak. I mean, he sprung an epic leak. Uh, he literally pissed his pants, uh, and he had never. Uh, you know, he was he was kind of a he's one of those cops. It's like okay, something's going on out here. Let's check it out. I don't know exactly what, but let's find out what it is, and then we can go from there. Uh, when we got roared at, I think that pretty much put him in the in the column of, yeah, I know it's there. Yeah. Um, how, how strong was the roar? How loud was it? I mean, was it because people describe it as almost like vibrating, uh, like you you vibrate or the car will vibrate. Oh no, it it it, it, it run right through you. You can feel it in your chest. That's how strong it is. I never felt anything like that before. I mean, it, you know, it felt like it. It was it was shaking my insides. That's how that's how strong. How much how much volume and power was behind that? You know, that's kind of a baptism by fire. I mean, you think about it. There's in New Mexico or anywhere in North America. There's no known animal. Uh, you know, on the record that can do that. There's just nothing. And so that's got to be a real wake up call instantaneously when that happens. I, let me tell you, Gonzo got woke up. (laughs) (laughs) I I got woke up, (laughs) you know, and then, you know, when you see the outline in your rear view mirror after it happens and you're speeding off. It all has the ambient light from the taillights to see the outline. That's, well, you a, can that's see a wake it. up call. Yo, oh. that's a wake up call. That's how close it was. Wow. You know what I think? It was about. probably not more than ten feet off my bumper. And I took I took uh Will to the area and right next to that where that pecan orchard's at is a uh, there's a field that's just nothing but, you know, it's a lot of it's salt cedar, tamarisk, uh, but there's uh, native trees in there. There's probably um, uh, giant blue grama. You know, it's just, I mean, the undergrowth is so thick in that area. Uh, my speculation was, and like I told Will, is that it probably seen us stop there and start counting and it made its way around through that area and come up right behind us and that's when it roared at us yeah you know i think about the time when will and and brenda and i'm trying to think other people talked about it's it's not real common but it's enough that the creature will come up and actually grab the vehicle and hold it you know and kind of keep you oh shake the hell out of it sometimes yeah, uh, there's yeah. a lot of reports about how they, you know, it'll shake and try to rock the vehicle or, or, uh, you know, keep it from speeding off. Uh, and if it wanted to grab us, it probably could have, uh, because, you know, my attention was focused on all the eyes out in that orchard. Uh, I didn't notice it was behind us until it, it roared and I looked in the rear view mirror and threw it in the drive, you know. And stomped on the gas, and that's when I seen the outline, and it was fairly close. <laughs> that's just got to be uh, quite an experience. Two other experiences that you've talk- talked about in the past. Um, one of them is, I think there was a gentleman that was out watering his lawn or his garden, and one walked by and he squirted it with the hose. Can you tell us, relay that encounter to us? Yeah, that was, uh, that was over in, uh, over in the Three Rivers region. Uh, a friend of mine, Johnny, he's got, uh, well, God, he's dead now. He passed away last year. Uh, he had a ranch in the Three Rivers area, uh, had potted tomato plants and, you know, other vegetable plants. He'd, he'd grow in pots, not in, not in like a typical garden. 
um, he's out there watering his plants and one kind of surprised him, uh, in the, uh, scrub brush stood up and was walking. And, and when he noticed, he's like, Oh shit. Well, as he noticed it, he, you know, we had that water hose and shot it with the water hose. Well, that didn't go over real well. <laughs> so, <laughs> apparently, uh, it was pissed. It had come into his house like, oh, God. You mean the hose doesn't have as much power as a shotgun? <laughs> um, well, you get squirted with a water hose. You, you're not real happy about it either, are you? <laughs> you'd almost wish somebody had shot you with a shotgun because it'd be done deal at that point. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I don't know if it was uh, like uh, two weeks or three weeks, something like that. It had passed. Wakes up in the middle of the night, like two in the morning. And what woke him up was a, just a foul odor. And uh, woke him up out of a dead sleep. And he's looking around and all of a sudden this damn thing's standing over top of him and just pummels the shit out of him. I mean, just beats the living tar out of him. Um, I get a call at all oh, like six in the morning. I'm getting ready to go to an internship, do a, uh, on a task force. And, uh, I'm on my way out of town. I get a phone call. He said, yeah, I'm at the hospital. This is where I'm at. This is the room I'm in. So I show up. Sure, shit. He, I mean, the tars just beat the living hell right out of him. Uh, arms all bandaged up. Uh, got multiple lacerations, multiple bruises. And I'm like, good God, Johnny, what the hell happened? And he told me. And, uh, and then, of course, he said that Effer bit my finger off, and it he was missing the digit. And I'm like, holy shit. Apparently, when it grabbed him, it threw him up against the wall so damn hard, it knocked him out. It bit it, the whole so, finger pinky? Or the... No, no, it was, it was the middle finger. It was gone down wow. to the second knuckle. So I'm thinking maybe he was trying to deflect blows and got it in the way and the damn thing it just reached down and bit the shit out of his finger, took it off. So anyways, I said, all right, well, you know, where's your son? He told me, he said, he's on his way. I said, okay. So I go out there, lo and behold, my buddy from Vinton minus uh, Grizzly Adams the the deranged biker he's already out there and uh i called a couple other researchers in the area and they said uh i said do you mind if i go in and and like he said yeah you can go in he said give me your phone you're not taking any pictures son of a bitch I, come on robert he goes no no pictures so i go in and i'm kind of looking around and this house is tore to shit. It's like a freight train went through it. Uh, cabinets ripped off the walls, dishes busted, uh, 150 year old China cabinet in splinters. Uh, and this isn't a small China cabinet. This is a, a one of these old, old world craftsmanship, heavy mahogany china hutches and it's in splinters uh pisses all over the damn house uh, and johnny's not a housekeeper but i'm i'm pretty sure he's house broke enough that he removes the damn dishes out of the sink before he pees in it uh and i can't see johnny pissing all up and down his hallway his bedroom's a shambles and so i come out and and Robert kind of looked at me. He said, amazing, isn't it? And I'm like, yeah, kind of. <laughs> Holy shit. And he said, uh, just so you know, 
uh, this never happened. I'm like, yeah, figures. Well, it wasn't long after that, uh, Johnny got out of the hospital. Uh, Johnny mysteriously sold his ranch. And ended up with a new parcel of land in Weed, New Mexico, clear up on the mountain. And he was down in the, you know, the lower elevations, but they, they put him up higher. And the land now belongs to the BLM. Totally destroyed his ranch. They leveled it. There's not even so much as a, a stick of the old construction left. There's a foundation. That's about it. Everything else is gone. Barn, house, uh, well house. Uh, even the, the driveway has been tore up and reclamated back to, a, you know, original landform. So that tells me a lot. Our government actually knows what the hell's going on. Yeah, that was my question, is why did they, why do you think that is? So, it's, yeah. Uh, you know, and, and Robert, probably going to get a phone call or at least a visit from him for mentioning his name, but uh, he works for one of those three-letter agencies that nobody can really stick their finger on and say, oh, yeah, that's who he works for, because nobody really knows. Uh, I've seen him with a Department of Homeland Defense badge. I've also seen him with Department of Agriculture badge. So nobody really knows exactly what department he works for. But uh, he does have law enforcement credentials. And, uh, you know, at one point he told me, he said, this is what I do for a living. He even offered me a job. And at the time, I'm like, uh, eh. As much as I want to, and trust me, I really want to, my wife ain't going to agree to this at all. And their vehicles are, when I pulled him over, he had actual welded wire grates over the windows. Had a welded wire grate over the, over the, the front glass, over his windshield. Now that Bolted speaks volumes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I took a picture of his, uh, one of their vehicles. It wasn't his, it was one of the vehicles that I do that was in his, uh, in his caravan. Because when we started having those instances, uh, back in 2015, uh, you all pick them out. They were all the same type vehicle, all moving in like a parade, all in a caravan. And they were all going to one location or another simultaneously, like ducks in a row. And, you know, I'd always see him and, and Grizzly Adams. And I, to this day, I still don't know who the hell Grizzly Adams really is. But he's, uh, you know, he's probably 6'3", about 250, likes to, you know, push his weight around. Um, and that's the, uh, you know, I, my understanding is they always go out in pairs. One one plays good cop, the other one plays bad cop. And bad cop always looks like a biker. ATW, hey, you had um, – actually, I had a couple more questions. One is the incident where the uh, the creature had thrown something through the window of those that older couple. And as I recall, you'd gone into the backyard – and can you give us some oh, no, details? That's, that's a separate incident. That's a separate incident. Uh, woman called up, had a, this is a Thanksgiving Eve night. Uh, had, uh, had a prowler around her house. I show up. And I go up to the door. It's an old woman, um, old Hispanic woman. Um said that, you know, he, he's in the backyard. He's in the backyard. Okay. So I go around one side, and there's a, around here they do a lot of stone fences. Well, that side was blocked off with a stone fence. 
So I'll go around the other side, and uh, as I'm walking around the corner, uh, you know, I carried a, a 1911 uh, that had a tack rail, and I had, had a tactical light on it. And as I get into the backyard, I'm shining the light around, and this thing's right up alongside the building, and my light hits mid-drift to that animal. And I'm going up and up and up. And I'm not a small person. I'm almost six feet tall. And as I'm going up, I'm actually pointing almost dead on to a 45-degree angle of where I'm standing. And that's when I finally got to his face. And by that time, he throws his hand up, covers his eyes, because that that tactical light's pretty bright. And uh, throws a piece of stove wood at me. Barely misses my head by just a few inches. Um, And I hear something behind me and, of course, the first thing that goes through my mind is, oh, shit, he's got a buddy, and he's behind me. Well, as I turn around and look, there's a dog cowering right behind me, like, go ahead, get him, get him. I'm right here. I'll cover you. And as I turn back around, that thing's already going off into the, you know, into the arroyos uh, where that house is at. And I meant to take Will to that house, show him that house, but we were running out of time. Uh, and that's, I mean, he was all 15 feet away from me. He was every bit of five foot wide, every bit of five foot wide. You know, that's one of the Uh, things that I want to try to get across to people is their speed and their reaction is, you know, we may hesitate. They don't. They're just instantly, you you said you turned around. Yes. Uh, and it's almost instantaneous. Um, they're, uh, they're, uh, they're what I, I call a reactor. Uh, stimulus happens, they react to the stimulus. Uh, all and there's no the- hesitancy. They, they do it instantly. Yeah, we... Uh, you know, we'll take a minute. We'll take a breath. Uh, we try to register what what's happening, and they don't. They just react to what's happening. Um, and it's uh, it's always been one of my my hypothesis is that because they're so conditioned to react to whatever we do. It's they're in self-preservation mode all the time, anyways. We're not. Uh, you could be conditioned that way uh, through bad experiences, through combat, uh, uh, through bad encounters with other humans. We're not conditioned to react to something like that. Because it's something that we did outside our realm of belief. So we take a half a second to kind of register what the hell we're looking at, what we're experiencing. And that's the difference between us and them. Yeah, they're they're, uh, very, very, very fast. You had mentioned, gosh, I think it was a year, year and a half ago, maybe not that long. You know, an old couple in New Mexico and a dog went out and challenged it. They had a big, I think it was a Mastiff or something. And it reacted yeah, just Mastiff, the dog Mastiff. toward it too. Yeah. 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 I know exactly what, what it, that, and that's over in the Three Rivers area. That's over going towards, uh, that's on the backside of El Gordo. Um, not far from where Johnny's old ranch used to be. Um, they had uh, they had a, a mastiff cross, um, but had the size of a mastiff. 
Uh, dog started growling, runs into the underbrush. They're out, kind of did the, the older couple just kind of walks around at night, you know, just kind of get their exercise. Um, and all of a sudden it, you know, like World War Three, this thing stands up, grabs this dog, and rips him apart and throws both halves at them. And is standing there glaring and growling. And then finally walks off back into the underbrush. Uh, when I got the call, it was probably three or four hours after it happened. And I go out there and, and interview them and take down their statements. And, uh, way outside my purview of law enforcement altogether because it's outside my jurisdiction uh but just you know out of curiosity for you know sasquatch knowledge and i want to find out exactly what happened i take down their statements and both of them had the same statement this is what we're doing this is what the dog did all of a sudden this is what this thing did stood up and ripped the dog in half pulled him apart you know how much strength it takes to pull a carcass apart? Oh, it's huge. A living, a living sentient being, tear them in half. The amount of strength is phenomenal. Bones, ling- uh, tendons, ligaments. The, the, that's probably the most resilient and the highest tensile strength things out there just for resiliency sake Uh, a spinal column can compress and expand as needed Uh, there was an old middle medieval term called drawn and quartered never really understood what that meant until I started reading medieval history And when they would draw and quarter somebody, they would take four horses. And you're thinking, okay, normal-sized horses. They'd tie ropes to each appendage on that individual. And when they draw and quartered them, they'd actually go four different directions with those horses. And that person would be suspended. Well, when I started thinking about it, okay, what was normal horse in medieval times? Draft horses. They didn't ride normal sort, sized horses like thoroughbreds or quarter horses. They all rode what they called a charger, which was a light draft horse. They got muscles. They got super muscles. It would take four horses to pull somebody apart. And a lot of times, a rope would break and they'd only pull them apart in three pieces. That's how much strength these animals have. They could actually pull a you know a dog apart in half. Um, down back at that incident in in off of Donovan, uh, where those dogs were all tore up, there were several dogs out there that had their lower jaw ripped off. It's like they pulled it apart at the jaw and ripped their lower jaw. That's a lot of strength. And on a pit bull, they got massive muscles. They got what they call double muscling in their jaws. That's how they can lock their jaws in place and not let go. That takes yeah, a lot I think of must have had rage or something. There's something going on. Uh, it, why it tore them apart. Well, I, it's always been my understanding they don't like dogs to begin with. And most dogs don't like them. They instinctually know that that's something not to mess with. What the hell possessed that mastiff to run into the undergrowth is beyond me. Probably thinking that, you know, it was probably a berry just running off. 
and then discovered, no, it's no bear, and it's got a hold of me. And I mean, the, the, this older couple are, you know, they, besides the fact of being shocked, they had both halves thrown at them. They just lost their family pet. So, you know, I'd spent a little bit of time with the older couple, and, I, you know, I told the, the old man, I said, whatever you do, don't go out there thinking you're going to get revenge. Just stay away from this area. If you, if you, can, if you can help it, just stay away from this area. Because it's showing dominance, and it just it gave you it, it gave you a warning. Don't come here. I wouldn't test that waters at all. Have they? Uh, have you heard of any follow up incidents with uh, with those folks? I know a lot of a lot of three letter agencies finally showed up to their place because they called Otero County Sheriff's Office. And a lot of three-letter agencies had showed up. Uh, I hadn't talked to them since. Uh, I'm thinking whatever had transpired, uh, I know that our government will basically shut down people that are making reports. And that's not what you saw. You saw a bear. No, that wasn't no bear. Bear doesn't have independent digits that move. A bear's not going to rip a dog in half and then throw both halves at you. It'll, it'll stand there and eat one of the halves. So I'm thinking that they probably got, they basically got, probably got told to, you know, keep your mouth shut. And we'll make this go away. Because I hadn't, I hadn't been back out to that area in probably over a year. And I probably need to go back in that area anyways because we just had a forest fire in that area. Uh, that started in the Three Rivers region and, and worked its way over uh, the Sacramento's, uh, over into the South Fork region. I probably need to go back in that area and kind of check it out and see see exactly if there was, you know, if there's a resident troop that lives there, uh, if it displaced them. T.W., we got to have you back. <laughs> yeah, we're, okay. we're, we're running low on time, fellas. We need to wrap this segment up. Always fascinating as usual, buddy. Hey, no problem. So, folks, I'm going to... We're going to put, uh, Tom will put some of the pictures on the website, and I'll put some on Facebook. Uh, they're kind of large files, so we kind of have to split them up a little bit. Yeah, that's, and I can I can reduce them down so they'll fit on the uh, on the webpage. So okay, that'll be that, no problem at all. TW, always, always look forward to talking to you, and you have a ton of information. I don't think we have a single witness uh, on our show who has as much good solid information not even close to what you have really appreciate it i uh, you know here's the thing and it, it, the difference between me and most witnesses is, is that i'm actual i go out and research that's it drives my wife insane absolutely drives her nuts uh and i'm like look it's not that i don't love you i love you a lot uh, and if you want me to stay loving you, you're going to let me go do this because this keeps us from killing each other. <laughs> uh, Does she make you buy life insurance before you go out there? Oh, she doesn't believe in the existence of, of Bigfoot. Uh, uh, she's mad that I got the kids, you know, the, my little six-year-old, uh-huh, him, him real, mom. Dad told me him real. Yeah. <laughs> that makes her mad or hell. Hey, TW, you though. Know, go ahead. If you do go out, uh, if you don't have a hose handy, at least 
carry a squirt gun or one of those super soakers. <laughs> oh, hell no. Uh-uh. I carry that 450 Marlin. Because <laughs> you're my trying, you're, get ventilated quick. You're trying to get him in trouble, <laughs> Brian. <laughs> All right, fellas. Well, listen. Great discussion. Uh, everybody stay tuned for the next segment. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G, at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open out there.